Memorial Day, friends. <laughs> and the crowd uh, acted like it was Memorial Day, right? <laughs> morning here. Good morning. There you go. See, morning, morning. All righty. If you would, please uh, look in your program today. Your own personal copy of God's Word would be great, whether that it be in leather bound, hardcover, soft cover, iPad, Nook, iPhone, Android, whatever you got, dig it out. And make sure you have your notes, that way you can follow along when we're barking, asking you to repeat something or be reading the same English translation out of the 153 we have in America today. We've zeroed it down to a two or three we use on a regular basis for easy read and grasping of the text. Notice that the lesson today, the message today, the story of Abraham and Lot, we're going through the year looking at uh, great stories of the Bible, life stories, stories to live by. And boy, this one's no different, I would tell you. Notice on the inside of the handout, the title that we've given to this sermon today, How to Make a Needful Life Change. Are you needing to make a life change? Maybe you already have. Maybe you need to and you're going to discover it today that you need to. But uh, we want to help you with that today, and the Bible does. For the follower of Christ, the Christ follower, what should you take into consideration? What do we find in the Bible that would help us take into consideration things to be looked at, examined, thought about, considered when making a big change or making a life decision? We make them every day, don't we? I said big, just life decisions. Is there a process to it? We're going to look at those in Scripture today. And I hope you find it and pray you do find it very, very helpful. Um, before we get started, I want to have a word of prayer and ask His blessing upon the lesson today, the sermon today. Obviously, as you look around, you say, man, did the rapture take place? Well, obviously it didn't. You're here. I mean, duh. If it had taken place, those that are not here on a holiday weekend, see, wouldn't have made it, right? Because they're missing church. So, of course, you'd have gone, and then we'd have been up there. We wouldn't have been laughing. We'd have been saying, I wonder what those, that gang is thinking that was left there. Hopefully, the pastor would be missing as well, is what you really pray for. But, yes, yeah, several people. Every holiday weekend, especially Memorial Day weekend and Labor Day weekend and others, but Memorial Day weekend in the spring... I think coming out of winter, people look, and it just, i got to go do something. And there's a little bit of daylight to do so. And so, yeah, we have several people gone today. And sincerely, I want to pray and thank the Lord for the purpose of uh, Memorial Day weekend is to say thank you to those that did serve. And so many gave their lives. Uh, it is estimated that in World War II alone, World War II, the total death count from those four or five years of war, topped 70 million people killed. 70 million World War II. Half of them civilians. Over 35 million people caught in war around the globe trying to stop evil. You say, oh, it's terrible. They lost so many lives. Can you imagine had uh, Nazi Germany, and at that time, um, the, the onslaught of uh, Japan. Can you imagine what the world would be like had they not stopped, been stopped? And the, the number of deaths in the globe. It costs greatly to, um, to keep peace of some nature on earth. There will be no lasting peace until the Prince of Peace returns. And um, we look forward to that day. Amen? Amen, amen. So we want to pray for, the, for and remember those. We also, uh, sincerely, I mean, we want to pray for folk that are traveling. I hate to hear that. Come to the end of the day, and I always watch the news at 6 o'clock. I'll grab it and say, okay, I wonder how many died in the roads of Maine this, week, this year. You hope none. You pray none. But a lot of our folk traveling, so let's pray for them. What do you say? And, and just for you to have a good weekend this weekend. So be careful out there. I think of a prayer before I go to prayer that I heard Dr. Falwell say many, many, matter of fact, it was a few decades ago now. It's a great thing about getting older. Uh, you can study a few years ago, now it's a few decades ago. But I remember hearing him, I was down at a pastor's conference in Lynchburg, and, and uh, he'd get up to pray, and he said, uh, 
he began to pray and, and, and was talking about uh, things he was going to do that day after the conference. And he said, Lord, as I head out to travel today, Lord, uh, protect others from me as I, try, as I drive. And also, Lord, uh, protect, protect me from others. So both ways. Not a bad prayer, is it? Let, let, let's, let's be safe out there and uh, pray for safety. Uh, pray for a good weekend. And uh, also uh, remember our veterans today. Shall we pray? Father, we take just a moment to say thank you and praise you for your love and grace, your goodness, your mercy. Lord, we are blessed to be able to spend this time together in the study of the Word of God. What a privilege. And Lord, thank you for the Word. I'm glad that we have the freedom. As I think of World War II, God, I'm glad for the freedoms that we enjoy in America where I can come here every week and open up the Word of God and study. No fear of retribution of any kind of somebody coming in and stifling our meeting and, and, and confiscating our Bibles and telling us that we cannot worship publicly. We are truly blessed. And Lord, I pray we will continue to retain that kind of freedom. Thank you, Lord, for those that were willing to shed their blood and give their lives to help us retain freedom and to stop the onslaught of evil. And God, we know that's going on in the world today as we continue to hear the wars and rumors of wars and the pillaging and the bombings and the fanaticism that's going on around the globe today. We have those that are serving today. Lord, I think of one in our own midst or one affiliated with us, God, Aaron Davis, and Lord, serving over in Afghanistan. God, be with him. Be with all those that he's affiliated with there in the military. Bring him home safely is our prayer. And God, we just pray comfort and healing to the families that have, that have lost loved ones to war. Might there be a sense, number one, of great gratitude on behalf of our nation? And might there be a peace with being able to wrap their hearts around their death was not in vain. Their death was not in vain. So, Lord, today we pray for those that are yet suffering. They didn't die, but they're suffering physically, emotionally, mentally, and in many ways. They're going to live out their lives with the results of war. And uh, God, comfort them and heal them, we pray. And now, Lord, for this, your holy word, we would pray your blessing upon the teaching. Oh, yes, and Lord, those that are traveling today, please watch over them. Watch over our flock today traveling safety, blessing on all the folk that are gathered here, and bless now the teaching of your holy word in Christ's name. Amen. I want to open uh, our thoughts here on how to make a needed life change. It's the story of Abraham, Abram, and Lot. My plan was, so that you'll know, I, I, I planned on covering more ground more quickly and, and, and hitting highlights of stories. Uh, and, and I'm confessing what seems obvious to some of you. I kind of got bogged down in Genesis, but I forgave myself for that, and I didn't take a vote, nor will I, and we're going to make believe that I'm, I'm being logical about this and doing it as planned, but it's not as planned, and I, boy, it's hard. With these, all these stories are so good. What did he have to write such a good book for? Man. Another great story following up Abraham. Remember how a week ago he went, uh, it was not a week ago he went down to Egypt, but a week ago we, we studied how that Abraham, having been called of Ur the Chaldees, he left and he went down, he said, I want you to go down into Canaan land, I want you to settle there. And he got down there at the place called what? Where? Where did he settle in the promised land? Bethel, yes, which means house of God. That's a good place. If you're going into the world like that and where God called you to, it's good to settle in the house of God, isn't it? Good place to be. What was the other town nearby? Ai, which means heap of ruins. Always a good reminder. As you're serving God, it's tough out there. Always a reminder where you're at. Um, as a matter of fact, next week, 
uh, tell the folks that aren't here, make sure they're here next week, and make sure you're here, by the way. And we're going, I'm going to do a sermon on uh, that very thing of living near AI. I'm going to take those thoughts along with other things that I've been collecting and thinking about and studying and researching on the modern day culture. I'll tell you what else wrapped into it was our study on Wednesday nights that I do in Man Cave, have been doing in Man Cave in the book of Daniel. And I caught a chapter out of Jeremiah where it tells us how to live he was telling, Jeremiah the prophet was telling Israel when they were captive to Babylon how to live in Babylon, how to live in captivity. The circumstances surrounding that, I said, oh my goodness, that's similar to the challenge of living in a now highly secularized culture that we live in. Though we love America and are thankful for it, boy, things have changed in the last few decades. So we're going to take our thoughts from that and talk about, well, Abraham living near AI in a foreign culture. What's that like? What are some things that, that God gives us through the prophet Jeremiah? What are trends we see in America today that are disturbing, challenging? What's been happening to the church over the last 20 years that is unsettling? It's the big pink elephant in the room. We might as well talk about it. Okay? Boy, I wouldn't want to miss that sermon. Oh, that's right. I will be here. I'll be preaching it. Join me next week as we examine what's happening in American culture, what's happening in the church in America. It's not, it's not encouraging. But let's face the facts. And how do we live within that society in which we live? Okay? Now, they're living in that kind of culture that day. Abraham and all them, they've been to the promised land. Then they drift, and famine came, some hard times came, and they drifted away and went where? Remember where they journeyed to? Egypt, down by the Nile. Famine in the land? Supposed to stay there, live by faith? No. They packed up and they headed down to Egypt. How'd that work out? Not so good. Not so good. So they turned around eventually, and they worked their way back. They're back in the land. Well, we're looking at that time period right there where they've come back. Abraham and all of his family, all of his holdings, and he's back in the land. And I want you to see what happened between himself and Lot as they settled there in the land. Amen to that word of praise right there. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, that would be best done in next Sunday's sermon. <laughs> About 15 minutes into me describing what's happened to the American church, please have that baby in here to do that. <laughs> that's right, and that's what I'll be doing. <laughs> Lord, what do you want us to do? All righty. All right, let's talk about making a bad decision. I caught this article this last week and uh, thought I'd share it with you. Bad, a, life, a bad life decision. This was just a few days ago. I, who's familiar? How many of you are familiar with Garrison Keillor? Any of you? A few of you? Yeah, oh yeah. Writer's Almanac. I catch that almost, well, Monday through Friday. I can't try to catch that. And uh, he had this one the other day. And it happened to be on the day of Margaret Wise Brown. How many of you have read any of her children's books? Margaret Wise Brown. Or, yeah, several of you have. Uh, today, I did, but it's too heavy reading and I just can't keep it up. Uh, today is the birthday, this was the other day, of the author and classic children's book. Uh, Good Night Moon by Margaret Wise Brown. She was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1910. Brownie, as she was called, as she was known by her friends, had a revolutionary idea about children's stories. Kids would rather read about things from their own world than fairy tales and fables. She was a lovely green-eyed blonde, extravagant and a little eccentric. With her first royalty check, she bought a street vendor's entire cart full of flowers and then threw a party at her Upper East Side apartment to show off her purchase. She was a prolific author, writing nearly a hundred picture books under several pen names, and sometimes keeping six different publishers busy at once with her projects. She was known to produce a book just so that she could buy a plane ticket and go to Europe. Rough life. At one time, she dated Juan Carlos, Prince of Spain, in case you were wondering. 
And she had a long-term relationship with Michael Strange, in case you were wondering, and John Barrymore's ex-wife. When she was 42, listen carefully, when she was 42, she met James Stillman Rockefeller Jr. Yeah, getting close to home, isn't it? Uh, who was 26 at a party, and they hit it off immediately. <clears throat> they had a similar whimsical take on life and were engaged to be married when she died suddenly. She had had surgery a few weeks before. She was kicking up her leg like a can-can dancer to show her doctor how well she felt. The kick dislodged a blood clot that was in her leg, and the clot traveled to her heart, to her heart killing her. You don't know whether to laugh or cry, do you? It, I caught myself being a smart aleck. <laughs> and then I went, oh, my God, that, you can't laugh at that. But you know what? That's a bad decision. That was a bad decision. You never know. Talk about making big decisions. You want to make sure of what you're doing before you do it. Try to have all the facts and make a good decision. By the way, side note, her ashes were scattered at her island home on Vinyl Haven here in off Maine. So there you go. Did you find that good? Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Do I get props for that? All right, let's take a look here. Genesis chapter 13, 1 through 18, with the three minutes we have remaining, and let's cover our sermon today. All right. How to make needful life changes. Well, first of all, change change through personal correction. Change through personal correction. What do I mean by that? What do you mean, Rev? What do you mean change? Well, just like Abraham. In verses 1 through 4, Abraham was down in Egypt. God didn't tell him to get down to Egypt. I don't see anywhere where he prayed, said, oh, Lord, we're in the midst of a famine. I know you told us to come to Bethel. We're here. We're settled in the very heart of the promised land. But, you know, I've looked around and said, boy, the famine is coming. I'm panicking a little bit here. I, look at the, look at the, I'm going to lose some of my crops, some of my uh, herds and what have you. i got a big family. It makes sense to me to go down to Egypt near the Nile, to go down into what the Bible types as a type of the world. That makes more sense. I'll, I, I, can, I can, listen, God, you stay right there, keep Bethel right there, the house of God, but I'm going to drift off. I'll be missing church next Sunday, but I'm going to head down to the, to the Nile, and I'm going to take care of myself. I will take this into my own hands. It did not work out, as you know, and back he came. So as, I'm, as you're making decisions... As you're considering change, change through personal correction. Make good changes in your life. Maybe you've already made some bad decisions and you're saying, what do I do now? Change through personal corrections. Let me give you three thoughts here under this one. First of all, change has to be marked by repentance. Notice verses 1 and 2. So Abram left Egypt, verses 1 and 2. Abram left Egypt, traveled north to the Negev. That's the desert area, the Sinai. Along with his wife and Lot and all that they owned. Abram was very rich in livestock, silver and gold. So he's very wealthy. He could have, he could have looked at himself and said, Listen, I can make what decision I want because look, look I have all these holdings. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously blessed of God, so I can make a decision to go down to Egypt because, hey, if you're rich and wealthy, that's a sign that you're in the center of God's will. Amen? Whoa. Lot, lot, uh, too many people have taught that over the last few decades, but it's not accurate. It's not accurate at all. Riches have nothing to do with it. And so... You want to change through personal correction. First of all, change has to be marked by repentance. He found out he was wrong, and so he had to repent. That is, he had to turn around and head back to where he started from. He headed back to the house of God. He headed back to the center of worship of God. Now, we have a map here of the uh, journey that he took. He'd come in here to, Can he'd come in here to Canaan land. And then he traveled down through, come over here at the Nile, settled, found out he was wrong, so he came back here to the Negev, 
or that upper region of Mount Sinai made his way back up right to where he came from. And so repentance means to turn around. He turned around and headed back home. Number two, in this thought of change through personal correction, a change needs to be marked by a return or resolve. Verse number three, from the Negev, they continued traveling by stages toward Bethel, and they pitched their tents between Bethel and Ai, where they had camped before. If you find you're out of the will of God, if you've drifted one way or the other, Christian friend, Christ follower, then come back to that place where you know You're in the center of God's will. Come back to start. Let's start over again. All right, let's redo this. Thirdly, under this thought, change is marked by reverence. So change through personal correction. Third thing, change marked by reverence. Verse 4, this was the same place where Abram had built the what? The altar. And there he worshipped the Lord again. It almost tells, look at that verse. It almost tells us that he left on his own. He took matters into his own hand. He took his family, went down across the Negev, down into Egypt. Yeah, they could water the crops or the, the, the flock and the herds and all the rest. But he was out of the will of God, and it makes it look like he didn't do much praying or worshiping, doesn't it? Look at verse 4. He returns, comes back to the house of God there at Bethel, and l- let me read it again. Verse 4. This was the same place Abraham built the altar, and there he worshiped the Lord. What's the last word? Again. <laughs> he was worshiping the Lord. The Lord. Ah! Oh, famine's got... And he, he goes off on his own on an emotional tear, takes his whole family down there, doesn't work out, comes all the way back, takes weeks, months, whatever it was, and then he starts worshiping again. See, boy, it just messes you up in your Bible reading, you're praying and sensing God's moving when you just go off on your own in a panic listening to the world give its advice. And let me give you some advice. Since we're given advice, let me give you some advice. Some more advice in addition to the advice you're already getting. Be careful when you're listening to your chums. That isn't that biblical. I, 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 it wearies me at times when people when people come and ask when people come and ask me. Well, pastor, what do you think of us and so? And I'm honest. I'm, I'm always honest, but. You know, you try to be very tactful as well to tell somebody, oh, I, biblically, I, I don't know that that makes sense. But I've asked, my friends agree with me, how many times do you hear that? People will do stuff and they'll say, but my friends, you want to check, number one, how many friends you think you really have. Boy, a real friend, you might have maybe one, two. Real friend. We got lots of acquaintances and pals and chums and all the rest. But be careful. Listen, your your acquaintances are going to tell you what? When you come and say, well, I'm already making this decision. What do you think of it? Oh, yeah. I've had people tell to me that, well, I, you know, I was at the bar and I was having to drink some of my friends and I asked them and they agreed with me. So, And I'm like, have you lost your scruples what are you talking about and by the way don't ever tell a preacher that stuff don't tell me those things it just it makes wires go i have my, my it's hard enough holding this thing together as it is in there but you know <coughs> the wires get frayed and sparks fly and i keep losing more hair i mean really don't say that kind of stuff Tell me that you've researched the Word of God. You've patiently waited and you've prayed and you've sought godly biblical advice. Tell me that. But don't, I don't, I could care less. This is preaching. I could care less what your chums say. I want to, that's right, brother. I want to know what God says. Yeah. Man. How do you think America and the church in America is in the trouble it's in today? Listen to everything but God. All right, that's my first thought. Change through personal correction. Number two, change through patient consideration. 
By the way, the reason I can get so worked up on this stuff, <laughs> because I'm examining my own life when I develop this stuff. Rockwell, would you take your time, son? Change through patient consideration, verses 5 through 9. Make a thorough overview of your situation. Notice verses 5 through 7. Lot, who was traveling, this is his nephew, Lot, who was traveling with Abram, had also become very wealthy with flocks and sheep and goats, herds and cattle, and many tents. And the land could not support both Abram and Lot with all their flocks and herds and living so close together. So guess what? The relatives get together and they begin to fight over their possessions and money. Aren't you glad we never do that today? Verse 7, so disputes broke out between the herdsmen of Abraham and Lot. At that time, Canaanites and parasites, parasites <laughs> were also living in the land. <laughs> so as you're getting ready to make a big decision, be patient. Take your time because things can get emotional. Do you think they were pretty emotional here? <laughs> they took our flocks. They mixed some of the sheep and the cattle. And the, no, that was your group. Lot, the, the Abraham's, Abraham's herdsmen, they've been stealing sheep. No, I didn't either. And they're over there. They're clanging their staffs together and hooking each other with their staffs and poking. And they're having an awful time. You, you have to calm down. Take your time. Do a full overview. Where had we started from? What did God tell us to do? Okay, we made this crazy journey to Egypt out of the will of God. We've been blessed financially and our crops have been, I mean, our, I keep saying crops, herds and, and, and flocks have been growing. We're very wealthy, went down to Egypt wealthy, came back very wealthy. We're settling again in the promised land amidst the enemy Lots of rumors are flying, pressures, stress, strain, challenges. Now we've got infighting. Maybe you ought to take a breath and think something through. See, when everything's all wound up, it's not the time to make a big decision. So make a thorough overview. Next thought under this is make a thoughtful offer. Look at 8 and 9. <clears throat> finally, Abram said to Lot, finally, which means he took some time, Abram said to Lot, let's not allow this conflict to come between us and our herdsmen. After all, we are close relatives. The whole countryside is open to you. Take your choice of any section of the land you want and we'll separate. If you want the land to the left, then I'll take the land to the right. If you prefer the land to the right, then I'll go to the left. So, make a thoughtful offer. Isn't Abram being thoughtful and gracious? Is he not? You know what, young Lot, young man? You look around as they're up there in the hills of the Promised Land looking down over the Jordan Valley. Man, it's beautiful. Whew, look at the rich land. You pick where you want to go and you help yourself, I'll, I'll, I'll go the other way. Give you all the room you want. What faith Abram had at that point. Do you suppose he learned something from that trip to Egypt? <laughs> Boy, he's taking his time now. He's being pretty open now, pretty gracious now. Pretty trusting in the sovereignty of God now. Lot, you pick what you want because I know that I serve a sovereign, almighty, all-seeing God. He's promised me an eternal heritage here in this promised land. He said, we're going, to have, we're going to have descendants like the sand of the sea and they're going to possess this land that I'm in. Go ahead, Lot, pick what you want. I'm going to trust the Lord in this. Well, uh, sometimes you lose in the world's estimation. You see, the, the worldly folk, like the, the gang that they were living amongst, they would have looked and said, what is wrong with this quote-unquote Christian guy? Abram, he's telling his nephew Lot, you go ahead and pick out what you want. Well, wait just a minute, he's the elder, he could have all he want. Why didn't he just take all the best and say, well, you can have the leftover? What is wrong with that guy? See, that's what the world does. That's mine for the taking, and I'm going to take it. It's my, I'm going to have, well, you know what? Nothing belongs to you, or nothing belongs to me. If we really are Christ followers, we believe this is the world. God created the world and everything in it. It was God who said through the psalmist that he owns all the cattle on the hills. He owns the silver in every mine, and we wished he'd send us a few more shekels, but, hey, we're blessed in compared to the world, amen? But he owns it all. 
You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. You don't own anything. You just think you do. It's on loan. But there's a lot of people living like Lot. I want it. A um, couple of illustrations. Uh, one is, uh, these are, I've used these before. In the last 17 years I've, uh, I've been here, used them a couple times. But there might be two people here that had not heard them yet. Um, one is this, that, uh, before, uh, that one that sticks out in my brain and, and it's going to take the judgment seat of Christ and I'm going to say, Lord, I've tortured myself since I did that. Would you please forgive me and help me to get over it? And he'll say, get over yourself, Rockwell. But uh, when we left Aroostook County, uh, it was right after uh, Pickett's charge during the Civil War. Um, and I married very young, by the way. But um, <clears throat> no, we were in Aroostook County, been there seven years, and in year number six, um, uh, we were thinking, we bought an old, an old home, I mean an old rundown, and it needed a complete flip. And um, my loving wife had some words of wisdom, and I didn't adhere to them. As the guy said the other day, um, as you're praying, you're listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And usually it's my wife. Sounds like my wife's voice. <laughs> uh, but that's, that was the case. And Richard, why don't we just take our time? Let's just simple, with some more prayer. To, oh, no, no, that's there. We got to get it. Go, 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 go. Not that I could be impulsive. <laughs> so bull and thrash, and of course, everything opened up. It had to be God's will because just look, everything <laughs> fell into place. I'm in the middle of a building project on an old house, tore apart, putting it back together all by myself, and the help of some carpenters and other people. But put it all back together. <clears throat> One year later, God says in the middle of it, um, I want you at Bangor Baptist Church on the rebuild of that ministry. My mind immediately went back and said, boy, I wished I hadn't gotten an old farmhouse in a rough spot trying to sell it. Wish they had not done that so quickly. We should have been more patient. We should have listened to some godly advice that came from my wife. And I didn't. And we didn't. And you know what? I paid for that for the next several years, literally. We made the move because there was no question God said, I need you in Bangor. I could have done that just like that and never had a problem. Had I listened at that time and been more patient, a better decision could have been made. There, maybe I can rid myself of that one. Another one that I've used, and I wanted to mention again, was my dad. God bless him. Died at 93 a few years ago. He was home with the Lord. This one just bit me hard. And I thought, man, Pops, what are you doing? Again, living in the land of people that would not do this like they were in Israel in the living amongst those other folk, the worldly, idol-worshiping folk that would just say, no, don't do that. Show me this next ma this map here. Uh, this is a Google map I did. Uh, this, uh, years ago, back in 1972 or 3, my dad put this, this is down uh, Route 1A, goes down to Winterport over here. Um, but that little side road, and my dad uh, put his mobile home in, built a couple little buildings over it, and there's the garage that he built. And he had that for many years. Somebody else got it now, obviously, and they've built up around here, different houses. These houses were there. But that's where my new my parents lived for many years. Well, back in the um, back during that time in the 80s, uh, as he was living there, when he purchased the land, he had a square piece of land. And some neighbors that I don't know who they are, I just remember at the time. Neighbors started saying, uh, we want this land. Look, that land is on this side of the dirt road. You obviously don't own the land. Well, my dad did own the land. And they were really giving him grief, negatively. And you know, my mom, which had my mother, I kind of followed my mother emotionally. We agreed in our advice, our godly advice to dad. I don't recall praying about it, but... And I said, well, I would give up. I have your land. Right now. Let's go out there with the muskets and we're standing our ground. Now go ahead and try to take it. Stupid. 
And my mother agreed with me. That's right. Colby, keep that land. So Dad went up to the uh, town manager's office. He checked all the maps and all that. Yep, sure enough. His land, a big chunk of pie shape of his land, went across the dirt road, and he owned, he owned that land. But they still pressured him. And so my dad went up to the office again and drafted the deed and gave it to him. There you go. And I'm like, well, what do you do with that? I mean, after all, really? Is he going to harvest potatoes over here? <laughs> really? <laughs> when you stop, after it was done, I said, man, you're blowing me away, Pops. You just giving it away? He said, peace was more important. Well, that's awful merciful, gracious. Well, that's awful neighborly and kind. Where do you read that in the Bible? I learned a lot on that. Yeah. Make a thoughtful offer. Oh, by the way, did the land belong to him? Really? Who's it belong to? It belongs to God. Just in charge of it a little bit for a little bit of time. Number three, our final thought, change, it's final, but it's not really final, a few more minutes. Change through providential commitment. Change through providential. That providence means God is overseeing you. Make change with the understanding that God is in your life and you want God in your life, that He's watching over you and as you make good, godly, wise decisions, He'll be with you and help you and strengthen you, guide you. Do an examination. Let's do an examination of Lot's decision process. What do you say as we look at this? I get down through. It says, verse 10 says, Lot took, look what Lot did. He took a long look, didn't he? Look at that. So let's take a look at Lot. What did he do? First of all, he was woeful in his devotions. Well, what verse have you got that, preacher? He was woeful in his devotions. As I went through the text... There's no mention anywhere that he had a devotional life. I read of Abram building. Man, that guy was building altars everywhere he went. I don't read anything about Lot. I never read of Lot building an altar. Peter says, notice the text in 2 Peter 2 and verse 8. Lot was what kind of man? He was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day as he was living in Sodom. Lot was, listen, Lot, don't let it, it doesn't say he was sinless. It said he was right with God. But he was worldly. Very worldly. A lot of that today, isn't there? He was woeful in his devotions because I don't read where he had any. Secondly, he was worldly in his desires. Look at verse 10. Lot took a look at the fertile plains of the Jordan Valley in the direction of Zoar. The whole area was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord and beautiful like the land of Egypt. It's funny they put that in there. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and turned it into a barbecue pit. Let's look at this next map uh, if we could. Uh, here's a view of the uh, looking up in the hills of the promised land and you're looking down upon some of the plains and down toward the Dead Sea. Let's look at the next one, if we could, uh, Shannon. And here's way up north. How's that for a picture? Well, this is way up north, looking south onto the Promised Land. Here's the Sea of Galilee. Jesus was raised right in this region. Jordan River, weaving its way down into the Dead Sea, and then all the way out the, uh, out of the ocean. But uh, Jerusalem would be right up here in the hills. This is all hill country. Bethel, right up in here. And so they're up in the high mountains, a high mountain, looking over this whole region all the way down to the side here and looking over the Dead Sea. And do I have another one or no? Is that it? Is that it? Can you go to the next one there for me? That's it? All right. You can't go to the next one because you don't have one, preacher. Uh, but he was worldly in his desires. He took a look. Ah, Well-watered plains. And he was wayward in his decision. Notice 11 through 13. Lot, look at these, 
Uh, let, let, say them with me. Say, if they're, uh, here, L say this with me. Lot chose for himself. Everybody say that. Lot chose for himself the whole Jordan Valley to the east of him. Say the next three words with me. He went there. See that? Lot chose for himself. He went there. It doesn't say God... Uh, he, he looked to God to guide him in making this decision, or under God's guidance he made a choice, and then under God's guidance he went there with his flocks and servants and parted company with his uncle Abram. So Abram settled in the land of Canaan, and Lot moved his tents to a place near where? Yeah, there you go. Settled among the cities of the plain. But the people of this area were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. Look where the man, worldly Lot, right before God, as far as his relationship with God, seemingly had very little worshipful life, though a saved man, we would say, but worldly in his view of life around him. You see that? Boy, couldn't this weave into next week's sermon awfully easy? And it probably will to a degree. Christian, as you're making decisions, please have a view to Lot. Are we living in the church of America today like Lot? Or like Abram? What about Abram? Let's have an examination of Abram's decision-making process. First of all, it was one of compassion. Remember at verses 8 and 9, he, his decision-making was based upon mercy and compassion and love and sovereignty. He made one of compassion, 8 and 9. He, gave it, he, gave the, he said, you take what you want, Lot. I'll settle for what's left because I trust in God. Number two, it was one of contemplation. Look at verses 14 through 17. After Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abram, look as far as you can see in every direction, north and south, east and west. I'm giving you all this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants as a permanent possession. The nation, listen, let me interrupt here. The nation of Israel, here's a side note. The nation of Israel, they are the descendants of Abraham. The nation of Israel has a promise from God that's rooted and grounded right here that they will have a, an eternal heritage and possession in the land they're in today. That's why they've come back as a nation. That's why they're there today. And when Christ returns, He will rule and reign with the nation of Israel. From Israel. An important thing to remember. And it should be encouraging to see that God blessed Abram. He holds to his promise. And though Israel has been 1,900 years scattered around the globe, 1948, God drew them back into the promised land. They're growing and strengthening of a nation. And they have a promise of an eternal heritage with God right there in the Middle East. That ought to encourage you and me to know that we are children of God. He gives us promises, eternal promises. He'll keep them all. Even when you get discouraged, even when you get worldly, and you're all tangled up in this crazy country world we live in today. Don't ever forget the sovereignty of God and Christian friend, make decisions that are well guided by God and His Word and don't make decisions without checking with Him. Have your life molded and shaped after His perfect will because He's in charge of it all. You're not going to live forever and one day He'll give you what He wants to give you. You can't, boy, I have to remind myself, Rockwell, don't whine while you're here. <laughs> you know, it's all good stuff. How come they got stuff and I don't have stuff? It's the biggest curse we've had in the last, four, in the last 40 years is the stuff. You spend 75, I don't, you do. 75% of your money on stuff. Somebody got the great idea 40 years ago in this country and was shipping overseas and around the globe, and they're just making stuff. We filled up every store in America with stuff, and everybody's going to go, go buy stuff. Look at what your money goes to. Stuff. <laughs> stuff. How did, my pa how did mom and dad ever do it back on the farm, back in the county? They had no stuff. No, really, think of it. They didn't have stuff. You see them, they went out and about killed themselves six days a week working to get food to put on the table. 
scratched the horse's ears and thanks for the work this week, and went in the house and family and tired and they didn't have any problem sleeping, get up early in the morning and work and go to church on the Lord's Day on Sunday, come home, that was it. Nobody sit around and said, uh, I can see Dad in 19, 1943. Well, Mrs., it's Friday night. What do you say we go into Holton and buy some stuff? <laughs> How much money's in the can? $7.42. Well, let's go buy some stuff, by golly. Hook up the horse and let's go. Or Model T. I don't know what he was driving. <laughs> let's walk. But I'm eight months pregnant. Well, you got another month. Let's go. Amen. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, I don't know where that went, where that came from. That's crazy. This guy's crazier than a hoot owl. But anyway, compassion, contemplation. God owns it all. Lastly, honestly, lastly. His was one of commitment. His was one of commitment. Notice verse 18. This is a beautiful thing. Here we're going to close up our thoughts. Abram moved his camp to Hebron. That's south of Jerusalem. And he settled near the oak grove. I think we have a map of that too. This is map day. All you geographic friends, there it is. Hebron. Hebron in the plain of Mamre. See, and notice how far down it is below Jerusalem. And he could look down off the mountains and see down into the Dead Sea and say, I wonder what Lot's doing down there. <gasps> but what did he do as he settled in the very center of the promised land? He moved his camp to Hebron. He settled near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. There he built what? To the Lord. Built another altar. And he plunked. And he stayed there. And as a matter of fact, all of his descendants, major descendants, were buried there along with him. He got back that time. He said, man, I got out of the will of God once. I ain't going to do that one again. And he stayed there, built an altar there, and worshiped the Lord there. Didn't have a perfect life. But he got back in the center of God's will. And other stories we'll tell later as we have a hard job getting out of Genesis. He ended up having to help Lot, who got himself down in the world made a mess. By the way, how did it all work out for Lot? Really? Amen? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with us this morning, if you would. By the way, God bless you and thank you for being here today on this Memorial Day weekend. It's always easy on holiday weekends to slip out and go somewhere here and there. We don't begrudge people that do. Glad that you came. I pray that your heart was encouraged I pray most of all that the, that, that the Holy Spirit was used in the Scriptures to encourage you today and guide you and help you. I know it has blessed my life just studying these wonderful stories of the Bible. As we take just a moment, just a minute or two, and then close in prayer, take a couple of minutes and just ponder your own life. Do you find yourself needing to return to Bethel? Do you need to build a new altar in Hebron? Right in the midst of the enemy. Right in the midst of the enemy. Right in the midst of the world. But you're right where God would have you be. Build a new altar today. And say, Lord, I find myself, I've come back to you, to the center of worship. I'm going to stay here by your grace and your strength. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Father. Forgive me. And help me to be prayerful and worshipful and spiritually be in the center of your divine will. I'm going to pause and let you think and pray just for a minute. Then we're going to close in prayer. Pray today.